Welcome everyone. I apologise that I have no uh, face. I um, had it yesterday and then obviously today when I've jumped in it's disappeared on me so I do apologise but I am here and I am real. Um, first of all I'd like to welcome everyone to Charles Sturt um, edX day one session 1.2. It's fantastic to have you in this session. We have um, a wonderful array of presentations today which will introduce us to a toolkit and a duck, um, take us beyond the, the crap test and give us a punchline on the LMS joke. Yes, an LMS joke, who can believe it? These presentations fall under the themes of teaching students to identify and evaluate online resources as responsible digital citizens. Um, so firstly, um, I'd just like you to be um, Sorry, I didn't realise we had that. There we are. Um, I would like us to be aware that this session will be recorded, um, which I will turn on now. Oh, I think someone's beaten me to the punch. Um, I also request participants to turn off their mics until the question and answer component. With a please do use, use the chat function to post questions or comments during the session. At the end of the session, I'll also invite you to evaluate this session and I'll put up the QR code again at the end. Um, before we move on to our presentations, I'd like to um, acknowledge that we pay our respects to all First Nations elders, both past and present across all lands where Charles State University staff and students reside. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of Aboriginal people to country. We also pay respects to other Aboriginal people and elders present here. And now um, I would like to welcome uh, Casey or Dr. Casey Garrison to introduce her team and tell us about the Truth Seekers Toolkit. Hey, thanks for that, Michelle. And I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Is that all good? Thumbs up. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, so thanks so much for having us um, today, everybody. So first, uh, we'd just like to start our presentation by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands where we live, work, and are presenting from today. For me, I'm in Gadigal and Birabirgal country, and Kay and Crystal are coming from Niagara and Turbal country. And we'd also like to extend our respect to First Nations people present here today, or perhaps listening to the recording later. Uh, so Crystal K and I, Special K as we like to call ourselves, <laughs> uh, we're the three members of the Masters of Education Teacher Librarianship team in the School of Information and Communication Studies, and K is our course director. So students in our course come in with an education qualification, so they're usually already working in schools, and then they get the teacher librarian bit through us to become fully qualified teacher librarians working in primary schools or secondary schools. Um, if you're not familiar with what a teacher librarian does, in addition to running the library, they basically can do it all when it comes to teaching and learning um, about how to find, evaluate, and use information in the school. So um, Artificial intelligence, AI, is a really important development in the role of the teacher librarian. Okay, so this presentation is based on a study that we recently completed looking at how teacher librarians can use generative artificial intelligence, GAI, uh, to support critical and ethical use of information with their students. So we employed a an exploratory case study method to investigate these three GAI tools, ChatGPT 3.5, Perplexity, and Quillbot. And we use the soft systems methodology of CatWo, sad kitty as we like to call it, <laughs> to analyze these tools. So CatWo is an acronym standing for customers, actors, transformation process, worldview, owners and environmental constraints. And Catwell provides a structure to understanding complex and changing situations, taking different perspectives into account and recognizing how those different perspectives impact the way that one addresses and acts in those difficult situations. Um, so we found it useful in considering how generative artificial intelligence is impacting the role of the teacher librarian so, and we have a QR code with references at the end of the presentation 
um, that you'll be able to get all this information. And we also have an article in press about this study coming up in the Journal of Australian Library, um, the Journal of the Australian Library and Information Association. But because we only have 10 minutes, we decided to just um, go into a bit more detail with some of our major findings, and that's about lateral reading and how lateral reading is a useful way to teach with artificial intelligence. So with that, I will just send to you, Kay. Thank you so much, Casey, and thank you everyone for um, coming on to listen to our presentation today. Um, so I would like to explain about how teacher librarians work and why we have suggested our findings that lateral reading might be an essential part of the Truth Seekers Toolkit for um, a TLS to help students to develop. Uh, teacher librarians work with students and teachers to build their skills in the critical evaluation of information. And even just five years ago, um, the focus was on teaching students to develop high quality information when researching for assessment tasks. Now the focus has broadened to incorporate not only assessment tasks, but also to develop students information fluency. This recognizes the importance of transferability of information literacy beyond a specific context and helps students realize that they should be applying critical evaluation to information regardless of where they encounter it. So skills hopefully become automatic and exception, accepting of mis- and disinformation. So this brings us to the impact of AI uh, and how it, how it has and will increasingly have an an impact on the information ecosystem, particularly in terms of the quality of information proliferating online. So previously, TLs taught the CRAP test and lots of libraries, our uni, every uni would teach the CRAP test, which is that you would look at the website or the source of information and evaluate the currency, the relevance, the authority, the accuracy and the purpose of the information that you have encountered in that particular website. Uh, however, the ideas behind the CRAP test are still relevant, but a lot has changed since it was first created by a university librarian in 2004 in terms of digital information. And as tools such as ChatGPT generate really convincing text without providing evidence of its provenance, strategies previously relied on like the CRAP test of less value, as their tools focus on the features of the text that are um, present in that one particular information source or that one particular encounter. So I've included on the slide a little snapshot of uh, an interaction with ChatGPT that a student might um, have, which is, you know, they're asked to evaluate um, the, the industry of mining in Queensland. And you can see that, in, that ChatGPT does generate a very balanced um, well, what it looks like on the surface, a very balanced perspe perspective of, of good things and bad things. And to a student that, that might just be, you know, very acceptable to them. However, um, when, we, when we dig deeper, we may find that the story isn't necessarily as clear cut as what is presented in the chat GPT response. So we're basically trying to suggest show students that the fact that text, image, video is a novel generation based upon unidentified training data, this means that it's not possible to understand the purpose of the content, the incidence of bias that may be generated within, that may be within the generated content. And in addition, um, it's easy and in fact, very common for generated text and content to be decontextualized and distributed via many different channels and used in many different ways. And therefore the information literacy strategy of lateral reading um, needs to be taken on board by students so that they can, before they um, start applying the content that they've encountered, they know they must compare the veracity of that content with a number of other reliable sources. So lateral reading is the action of leaving the information source and investigating other sources to establish the accuracy of the response. Um, and it's a case, we believe that this is a key skill that students need to have in this new environment as part of their toolkit. And Crystal is now going to, I'm handing over to her, she's going to be talking about how we might use um, perplexity to help students develop their skills with lateral reading. Thanks, Kay. So perplexity 
Casey, could we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So Perplexity is a chatbot tool in which you can uh, ask it a question and it'll generate an answer. And it's slightly different to search engines in that it synthesizes information from different sources together to provide a structured response. And it'll also provide a version of in-text referencing to the sites in which that information came from, which is a good thing and a bad thing because it demonstrates to students how you can um, synthesize information together, but it also can make it seem like it's a complete answer without needing to do anything with it, which is where the whole concept of lateral reading really comes into the forefront here. Basically, what we are proposing is that perplexity is the ideal tool to teach students how to conduct lateral reading. This tool brings together information from the different sources and then allows them to read through the responses, but then also go and check the original sources and check to make sure that what perplexity is saying is the correct answer or a good answer is accurate in the way that it's represented the information from the original sources, but it will also then prompt them to go and have a look at sources beyond those. So we're saying go and do their own research to have a look to see if sources outside of what Perplexity has brought together corroborate the information that Perplexity is putting together as a response to the question that they've asked. So I'm very aware that that was a very quick discussion of perplexity and how you can use it. There are more findings available in our article that Casey mentioned. Casey, could we go to the last slide, please? Because I've got 20 seconds left. So if you want the references, here is the QR code for you. And that article will be out later or next year, we hope. Um, and all of our findings are available to you there, including more detail on how you can use perplexity as well as some other tools to teach with and about AI with your students. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That um, was fantastic. And uh, there I am. Um, and also, I'm um, thrilled that you were amazing at keeping to time. So thank you so much. <laughs> Definitely a triple K threat. Um, brilliant. And thank you. We will have questions at the end. Now I'd like to pass over to Marissa and Ruth to find out if it quacks like a duck. Um, building skills to identify online nutrition quackery in tertiary education. Thanks, Michelle. And unfortunately, I can't share my screen. I will fix that. For <laughs> Thank you. Just as a bit of a bridge between that last presentation and ours, which I learned a lot from, so thank you. Um, we're now going to be talking about nutrition, so I love the special K sort of <laughs> serial connection. <laughs> Let me try again. No, still disabled. Uh, so we now, might. Marissa, sorry. Yep. There you go. You should be good to go now. Ah, yes. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. All right. So if I can just get a verbal acknowledgement that you can see. We can definitely see your PowerPoint. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, my name is Marissa Olson. Uh, and my colleague Ruth Crawford is with me and we're going to talk to you about how we are trying to scaffold some important skills in uh, identifying and critiquing online nutrition quackery in nutrition education. So I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people uh, and the uh, Pangarang, hopefully I've pronounced that right, uh, people where we're both sitting today. So I'll hand over to Ruth. Oops and try and get to the next slide. There we go. Thanks, Marissa. So why is it important to be able to judge the quality of nutrition information? Well, unhealthy dietary patterns are one of the most important modifiable risk factors for chronic disease. And whilst many factors are known to influence food choices and thus dietary patterns, including price, availability, access and income, in the context of knowledge, culture, attitudes and beliefs, we know that nutrition knowledge alone is not enough to change dietary habits and we also know that better nutrition knowledge does correlate with increased intakes of fruits and veg and better diet quality. 
So nowadays there are large amounts of nutrition information available, particularly online, some of which is inaccurate, not evidence-based and contradictory to the dietary guidelines. And this makes it harder for people to know if it is fact or fiction. This information may be inadvertently shared by well-intentioned individuals, whilst others may deliberately share it to promote their products and services. Now that anyone can disseminate information on social media, the spread of mis misinformation is significant. Pete Evans is a good example. He was recently fined over $100,000 for, uh, for alleged unlawful advertising of a machine to cure coronavirus, but previously it was his unsafe nutrition advice that got him in trouble. So we believe that an important skill for nutrition professionals is the ability to critically evaluate nutrition-related material that they come across in their practice, whilst also understanding that science does not tell us everything. If health professionals and science communicators can see through the myths and provide consistent evidence-based nutrition information, we can better support people to improve their diet quality and reduce rates of diet-related chronic conditions and complications. So what are we doing in our subjects to help students develop those skills? So in our presentation, we're going to show you some of the work that we've done and continuing to do during a recent course review to try and scaffold some of those skills that we believe are essential to support students to critically evaluate the ideas about nutrition in their practice, uh, which are probably transferable to a lot of different um, professional contexts. So we're particularly going to draw on the work of Wilson and Devereaux to frame the strategies that we use as both designed in meaning those really carefully sequenced and structured subtasks that we use to lead to the completion of a major task and the contingent scaffolding, which really happens in those moment-to-moment -moment interactions between teachers and students to ultimately aim for transformative and engaging learning experiences. So this diagram um, I've tried to sort of capture, I know it's a bit busy, I've tried to capture some of the skills that we've uh, thought about that are important. Also um, drawing from the competency standards from a nutrition and dietetics perspective to um, scaffold the development of those skills um, over the three years of the food and nutrition course in the subjects that we teach within. So obviously each of the subsequent years builds on the skills that are developed in the previous years. Um, and some of this is designed in because they're part of the learning outcomes, syllabus and assessments, but some are more contingent in that they do occur in the moment to moment conversations that we have in tutorials or in assessments that we do. Um, we've Ruth and I have been using interactive oral assessments in quite a few of our subjects, which are fabulous uh, in helping to dig a little deeper and helping students to reflect and apply their knowledge to um, a practical situation. Um, so in first year, we focus on some of the basics. Um, and I loved last presentation, and we're going to I'm going to definitely follow up on some of those things. Um, finding evidence and the basics of critiquing evidence. You know, what is evidence? Um, is it just the science? There's other ways of knowing that are really important for our students to consider. Who says what's evidence and what's valued and what's important? What are the other ways of knowing that we need to consider? Um, communication skills, uh, report writing, academic um, literacy, including referencing and academic integrity. And I think something else we need to think about is how do we scaffold in and think about AI uh, in this context too? And then research methods in food and nutrition. So one of the key messages being that qualitative research and qualitative ways of knowing and storytelling and those sorts of things are just as important and valuable as quantitative information. Uh, and we also do talk about scope of practice because we're uh, educating students in a context where they do need to be clear about um, what they are able to do when they graduate. Um, there is a difference between nutritionists and dietitians, for example. Then in second year, we try and build on those skills by starting to apply more um, them to the, the food and nutrition related content. So we do use the CRAP test, but um, I'm excited that we can extend that. Um, we, we feel that is a really good, simple test to start with because um, it helps. It, it can be applied to not just a journal article. It can go further than that. Um, but students can also um, use that 
in their future practice to help other people crit critique information that they might come across in the nutrition world. And the other one is reflective practice. So um, the importance of students thinking about the ideas that they've brought from pre-university study about nutrition. Everyone's got ideas about nutrition. Everyone eats. So um, they're very complex ideas. Where did they come from? You know, what information did they use to come up with that, those ideas and values? And I think that helps to develop some empathy for the people, I hope. Um, empathy for the people that they're going to be working with in the future. And again, we use our interactive orals um, to help them reflect and share their assumptions. And then finally, in third year, we try and consolidate those skills by further developing and applying them to um, various sort of um, food and nutrition practice contexts like public health nutrition um, and um, in food service environments discussing ideas with their peers in interactive orals and that sort of thing. So I'll let Ruth talk about the exercise science degree. Yeah, so as Marissa said, we also teach nutrition in the exercise science degree, but there's only two subjects and Marissa teaches them nutrition in first year and I take the third year sports nutrition subject. So here we take a similar approach as in the food and nutrition degree, but we have to truncate it. So in first year, instead of in second year, we start using the crap test. We start translating that information into practical messages and we expect the application of nutrition scope of practice. And then third year is basically the same, except we don't use as wide a range of critical appraisal tools in the exercise science degree. So next slide, please, Marissa. So an example of what I've learned um, is the importance of both the designed in and contingent scaffolding and the value of using myth busting to help our students learn how to judge the quality of evidence. So previously in the third year sports nutrition subject, I included a series of myth busting topics on the I2 side, which is an example of the designed in learning. Then in the live tutes, students who attend got the chance to ask questions about myths, thus facilitating the in the moment or contingent scaffolding. This year when I revised the content, I left the myths out thinking that there was too much material, but this had a couple of consequences. First, I noticed the opportuni opportunistic questions about myths in the tutorials are reduced, perhaps since the myth busting was not being role modeled on the I2 site. And second, for those who couldn't attend the tutes, it removed that opportunity for students to learn about using nutrition evidence to bust some myths. So to better help students to be able to judge the quality of nutrition information, I'll be adding back to the I2 material, the series of nutrition myths next year. It's one minute, Ruth. And I think that that's um, a really good example of um, how the contingent and um, planned in or designed in learning works. So one of the other things that I'm thinking about just briefly is uh, Indigenous ways of knowing and how do we bring uh, those other types of knowing into these conversations for students to challenge how they see evidence and information. And of course, we want to look at um, more broadly sort of evaluation of the whole process and um, continue that cycle of reflective practice for ourselves. So uh, here's our reference if anyone's interested in following up on that paper. And thank you so much. Oops, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ruth and Marissa. That was very really interesting and such an important topic with so much information out there that's not necessarily accurate or truthful. Um, now, I would like to hand over to Kate and Tabitha, who are going to take us beyond the crap test um, with librarians dialing up digital literacy. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And hi, everybody. My name is Kate, and Tabitha and I are beaming in from Wiradjuri country. Um, I'm down in Wagga and Tab up in Orange. Uh, we offer respect to the Wiradjuri people and elders and extend that respect to First Nations colleagues who might be in the room or tuning in later on. Uh, so Tabitha and I are here to talk about what we're learning and doing in the library to dial up our support for digital literacy. Next slide, please, Tab. 
Charles Sturt Librarian's research skills instruction for students is informed by our digital and information and research literacies frameworks. These are focused on developing students' proficiencies in working with digital technology and researching with a range of types of information, including online resources and the web. These make us the caretakers of the university's digital literacy and information and research literacies graduate learning outcomes. Librarians are strategically embedded in subjects to work with students on understanding the importance of research and digital skills as they relate to successful assessments, the workplace, and lifelong learning. The embedded program has been around for about 10 years or so and seen many advancements in technology and research methods. So we're pretty experienced in change and try to accept new, uh, new developments as challenges to step up our game. One device that stuck around is the CRAP test, which we're all pretty familiar with now. It's nice to hear um, others talking about the CRAP test. We'll see how many times we can say CRAP in this session. Um, it's taught in just about every one of our librarians' introduction to research skills classes. And CRAP is criteria used to evaluate information. So does anybody remember what it stands for? Currency, reliability, authority, and purpose. You can throw that extra A in there if you like. While this is tried and true and still holds up in traditional research, evaluation techniques are expanding and considering evolutions in technology and information sharing. Next slide, please, Tab. So as we know, the pandemic supercharged the need to be online. We've largely maintained that aspect of our work in the library with added zest as we've taken on projects this year to increase our experience and knowledge in generative AI tools, digital publishing and digital literacy skills development. This is building our capacity to support library users in navigating increasingly online information. Uh, I guess it's fair to say that information is primarily online these days. However, it's not lost on us that we work in buildings full of books. Exploring the relationship between print and digital is part of what makes our jobs interesting, but we've often received feedback and are asked for advice on how to address students' instincts to start and ultimately limit their research to Google. We encourage Google as a starting point, but it's a critical digital literacy skill to understand how to engage or not with information. And this is where evaluation comes back into it and where crap doesn't quite cut it anymore. We're looking to the evidence to understand techniques that may be better suited to, to the digital and AI age. And I'll hand over to Tabitha now to take us through what we're thinking about and a look into the start of a new digital literacy program for students. Sorry, couldn't find the unmute button. Don't you hate that? Okay, so um, what I'm going to do with you now is talk through the literature scan that we've done. So we scan the literature because, as Kate said, things change frequently. So um, we're going to talk through what that looks like. And basically, it's come down to these key points. So information discovery to information overload. Again, that's something that's already been covered, and I suspect we'll hear it a few times. Uh, information overload and fake news. That's another one that we've all heard about. Fact checking and critical ignoring, and then talk more about what the library's response is. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Now, I've got some pictures on the slide here. Um, what I wanted to do with these pictures, so the first is your traditional library with um, lots of books. It used to be that finding information was about that information discovery. It was about finding the information, looking through what you'd found, and then evaluating it. Um, so you now have more um more recently, um, it's certainly been our experience and the experience of um, 
Kuzreva et al. Um, this skill is more has become more uh, about sifting through that information online and then evaluating. And that's where the CRAP test came in. So for those of you that couldn't remember what the CRAP test stood for, um, you'll find a list of it here on the slide as well and a link to the page that all that information's on. So um, the skill now has been has become important um, as there's so much information out there available, findable, that it has the potential to overwhelm. And that's something that we've really seen discussed by um, an article by Addy. So, um, as I said, um, and as Kate's already said, information literacy and instruction um, at the library here and for many other libraries has revolved around that CRAP test or variations of it. So we have CRAP, but you can have it as an extra A with the extra A being uh, authority. One of the other topics that we've covered is that information overload and fake news. So we are, as Ruth said earlier, in the age of misinformation and disinformation. There are those out there deliberately trying to use the information overload to their own advantage. So this is where the need for critical ignoring comes in. It's a way of finding your way out of that maze of extra information, which is um, what I have a picture of here. Um, now, this has implications for universal design for learning. Um, expecting that um, resistance to the impulse um, to click or getting distracted by that information is a big issue. So um, that's where our next slide comes in, and that's um, fact-checking. So looking at fact-checking and critical ignoring. So um, there was a study done called the Stanford Study um, by uh, Weinberg and McGrew. Now, they were really surprised by the depth of the issue of young people's inability. Now, they were testing high school students, but this is still true for um, academics uh, the, the, the academic setting, um, but young people's inability to evaluate the information that flows through various social media channels and proliferates the internet. Um, so it's about that reading less to learn more. Now, um, the need for fact-checking um, and ignoring of excess information has been recognised for some time. And that's equated this need for changing to uh, teaching digital literacy. So reading less to learn more means that you contextualise the information. Rather than doing a deep dive like you do in the CRAP test, um, you dive into the site, you evaluate within that site. Digital literacy now uses the skills of the professional fact checkers. So um, these steps will include taking your bearings, contextualising the information with other information on the website, not just within that site, um, doing more lateral reading. Are there other sources to corroborate the information and being click resistant? There are lots of clickbait uh, out there. Um, people want you to go further and further in. Um, and it's a bit like following that rabbit down the rabbit hole. So you need to evaluate the inv information environment before going further into that site. So what's the library's response? We still have the CRAP test. The CRAP test still does have value, but within that, we've added a new digital literacy resource. So um, you can see a little bit of it here. What we're doing is talking through students around what fake news is, uh, those steps and uh, capabilities to evaluate that online content and to recognise the bias. Tabitha, that's almost your time. Thank you. That's excellent because I've almost finished. Um, these skills combined with the CRAP test allow students to gain a better understanding of that information rich landscape without having to read more. So if you want to know more, 
We have um, the references that I've been talking about here. Each of those has a link, and I'm very pleased to say that most of them you'll find in the library. Um, and at that point, I'm done. Thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. And certainly having watched my teenage children try and find resources and spend hours just clicking to the next, to the next, um, very relevant. So thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to hand over to Kirsten, Rebecca, Kathy and Ellen to talk about, um, to answer the question, what happens when everyone walks into an LMS? Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and before we start, I did ask ChatGPT whether that was funny, that conference title, and it uh, was quite guarded with maybe. So you might be the best judge of it. So welcome, everyone. Today I'm presenting with Ellen from the library, Kathy from Academic Skills, and Rebecca from the retention team about an approach that we are taking in our large foundation subjects in the School of Indigenous Australian Studies. And we also acknowledge the Wiradjuri peoples whose lands that we are on. These lands have always been places of learning. We pay our respects to elders, past and present, and honour them for maintaining the cultural and intellectual foundations that ensure these traditions continue in perpetuity. And in the absence of a formal Indigenous voice to Parliament, we are also committed to actively prioritising and amplifying, amplifying Indigenous voices and perspectives within and beyond our work. So um, our subjects IKC 100 and IKC 107 are large foundation subjects with a, just under 3,500 students across 2023. Um, so, and our students come into the subjects from virtually every course at Charles Sturt. So we take really seriously the supportive foundation that we can build alongside the discipline specific foundations that are needed for their courses. Collaboration is essential for building this foundation and we keep the student at the center of this work. And we also really value our sessional markers. Um, on this screen is a mix from ses of sessional and non-sessional staff. Um, their expertise and dedication enhances the quality of teaching and learning and contributes to a really cohesive approach that aligns with the diverse needs of students. So these two subjects are taught across four sessions. Um, and we have 25 to 30 markers across them, around six teaching staff, nine embedded tutors, a first year study advisor, tons of markers. Um, we work closely with the library and the academic skills team to provide wraparound support for our students. And we also work closely with the retention team um, on things like their pre and post census campaigns. And of course the embedded tutors and first year study advisor. So these are really important relationships to build and maintain um, because they each co contribute to comp comprehensive support from, for students. And just briefly, who our students are, 58% um, of the students who are about to start IKC 101 uh, over summer are first in family and 77% are commencing. So the image to the left is from our um, sessional staff hub. We have a discussion board in there for each subject. So this is for one. And this is where sessional and non-sessional staff work together on moderation and other elements of team teaching. Um, the collaboration is so important. So we haven't reviewed the hub formally yet, but this is in future planning, especially the extent to which it supports sessional staff with their understanding of the Indigenous standpoint pedagogy that we use in the school. But you can see there from the, um, the numbers of posts, um, and that was in actually a, quite a, a smaller student cohort, so fewer markers in that one, but it's really well used. And on the right side of the screen, we also use Cadmus as an assessment submission platform, which allows us to communicate really easily and effectively between staff without overburdening inboxes, without things getting lost. Um, so that sh this um, snip here shows some tagging that we can do for team communication around moderation and academic integrity. So I can tag that something needs to be moderated, someone else can tag that it is, and so on. It's a really streamlined, transparent and accountable approach, which also means that our reporting and reflection in Quasar is really straightforward. We have everything there. Ellen. 
So the library has implemented an embedded program um, that spans across all faculties and aims to target key subjects in various disciplines and courses. Uh, by placing an embedded librarian in these subjects, students are equipped with essential skills at the beginning of their course, therefore setting them up for future success. The core units of IKC 100 and IKC 101 are required for most courses, so having an embedded librarian, myself, in these subjects allows us to teach a large number of students um, and provide instruction on information literacy and effective utilisation of the library. These skills are developed over time and as assessment requirements become more complex, students can build, um, can continue to build upon the essential skills covered in this IKC 100 and 101 instruction. I, the embedded librarian, teach skills to students through a live class conducted by the um, by myself and covers deconstructing their assessment question for topic analysis and using this topic analysis to construct search strategies to find necessary resources. Students are also taught that the library catalog works differently to Google and are shown how to use Boolean search operators to successfully navigate around and locate appropriate resources. These classes emphasize the importance of reliable resources and teaches students how to assess, assess them using the CRAP test. The content of the class is focused on the second assessment for both subjects, which requires students to find peer reviewed articles to support their work. The class is recorded so that students can revisit the material and they also have access to a research skills guide, which covers everything taught in the class. This class and guide are not the only means of support provided to students. Students can contact me through the discussion forum of their subject sites, um, where I have a dedicated thread to be able to offer assistance. Additionally, students have the option to schedule a 45 minute appointment for one on one support um, when they're struggling to find resources, and this is used very, very heavily in the lead up to assessment too. The skills taught in IKC 100 and IKC 101 by myself as the embedded librarian provide a strong foundation for success in these subjects and for the future subjects in the student studies and their academic journey. Uh, so as part of the collaborative embedded support for the subjects, uh, Academic Skills presented workshops on analysing assessment tasks and rubrics note-taking, referencing and applying assessment feedback. Uh, these are core academic skills that students can be unprepared for on commencing higher education. Uh, as a foundation subject, explicit instruction on these topics is essential to many students' early success. The workshops also provided an opportunity to raise student awareness of the additional support available through the academic skills team. Uh, an embedded academic skills forum was also included where students were able to ask questions about a range of academic skills uh, across the two subjects, topics such as how to identify credible sources, APA 7 style referencing and critical thinking were addressed. The total number of student views of staff responses totaled over 1000 with interest remaining consistent over the course of the session. Uh, this reinforces both the need for academic skills support for students early in their study and that their responses to questions had a much broader reach than the original poster. Uh, the development of these academic skills early on will serve students throughout their studies and into their professional contexts. Thanks, Cathy. In many ways, the role of the first year study advisor works to provide a safety net for those students who are new to higher education and is especially important when working with the, the large cohorts that we see in IKC 100 and 101. As a first year study advisor, I regularly use the I2 sites to identify students at risk, including students who had not yet accessed the subject site or submitted early low stakes tasks. This has been a two way process with me communicating my concerns to the subject coordinators or them coming to me to do outreach to identified students. This outreach Outreach continued over the session, reaching out via email to any students who had failed assessments, reminding them of the services provided by the team, or discussing options with the retention team, especially before, uh, before census state. I've also used CADMAS extensively to identify students who had not yet accessed the uh, assessment portal. Oops, sorry, just missed my spot there. Or early assessment feedback, reminding them to do so and providing assistance in working with this. 
coming from this, I've been involved in collaborations for the academic skills team. Together, we've developed resources and presented workshops for both subjects based upon feedback from the first assessments, helping to provide assistance in a way that was subject specific. These resources were then embedded within discussion forums and so were easily accessible for students or tutors. Beyond this, I'm able to provide ongoing support and a familiar face as an embedded tutor across these subjects, helping students to better understand content and providing feedback on assessment drafts on a one-on-one -on -one basis via Zoom. Okay, so we're going to be, let me go back. We're going to be looking at how this approach is working for students as we continue, but in this subject context, it's not um, necessarily something that can be measured in a disconnected way. It's got to be contextualized. So the subject is a compulsory foundation subject for a wide range of students. Um, who are all coming to the subject reflecting particular understandings about their own positionality. So that matters when we're thinking about um, what works, um, as does the broader context of Charles Sturt having a, a really robust framework for embedding Indigenous perspectives and knowledges, which doesn't necessarily align with what we discovered um, the majority of Australians might want. Um, during the voice referendum. What we do know though, is that 90% of students access their assessment one feedback, which is so important to set up as a foundation for them actively participating in their learning across their university courses. We know that 90% of students rated their experience, just over 90% actually, rated their experience of CADMES as good to excellent. And that was with a response rate of just under 50% asking them how it was. So this isn't the kind of subject where results will necessarily be seen immediately, but these early insights suggest that our approach is fostering a constructive foundation for continuous improvement and success across their academic journey. Um, and that our role is only one part of that. So Thanks, this Kirsten. I might um, ask you to finish up and then we might move to questions. Okay, that's okay. Final sentence. Um, we also know that on the sessional hub, there were 255 forum posts across the session between the staff. So it was really well used and sessional say that it supports their work, their professional development, and their confidence. The end. Thank you. I should have waited one more moment, shouldn't I? <laughs> Thank you to everyone. That was um, amazing and so very interesting. As uh, a few comments in the chat said, you know, so much useful information for academics and students and obviously a lot of skills that are desperately needed across society when we're looking at working out what is the data and that's accurate and evidence-based. Um, so thank you, everyone. What I'd like to do now um, is obviously if everyone would like to show their um, thanks to our presenters, I'll now open the sessions for questions. If you would like to use the raise hand function, if you have a question, and please indicate who the question is for. Okay, so I'm um, Caroline. Beautiful. Over to you. Fantastic. Thank you all presenters. That was really engaging. And I won't hog the floor. I shall ask one question and it's probably to Tabitha. And it strikes me that reading, the skill of reading is absolutely critical um, in, term, in a world where we have information overload. And I wonder how much focus is put on reading skills. I remember Peter Butler being here and he used to say that was absolutely the thing, and I see it with our students, that potentially they won't succeed because well, they've got less chance of succeeding because they're slow readers. Thank you. So that's that's probably a, more of a, a learning and teaching question. Um, I know that they um, there are resources available for students to um, learn to read uh critical information and how to pull that critical information out without having to read necessarily every single word. Um, the, um, the work that we were talking about, that, that concept of critical ignoring, is about um, pulling out the key information. Um, so whether that's done online digitally or whether that's done as part of that uh, information literacy 
as well. Um, it is a skill. It is a really important skill, Caroline, I agree. Um, but um, I know that learning and teaching have certainly addressed that um, with the resources that they have as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now, Linda has just asked in the chat, first year study advisors, what is this, um, what is scope of practice and what is the administration unit? Kirsten, uh, I might can, hand over to you. Could I just clarify, I was actually asking what is the scope of practice of the first year study advisor? Oh, okay. So, Beck, you might want to answer that, but also I know we have Sarah here who um, is Beck's manager too. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Kirsten. Um, well, I have um, basically I worked as a, a sessional academic um, through SIAS um, and um, was picked up by the retention team. So um, it not only involves looking at uh, the data relating to students, including um, those, those students who are continuing, but also just being that that like I said, that, that safety net, or as people have said before, you know, like a subject mum, that person that they can go to if they're having issues. Because, I mean, obviously when you've got cohorts over a 1,000 people, um, that one person who is, is constantly there, so I'm putting out announcements quite regularly, um, and they're just tapping in so that they know that I'm that one person who they can contact, and then I can um, get in contact with the subject coordinators past that point. So can so I check the retention? Sorry, I, I just say so. Can I check that you mean that there is a, a particular um, person assigned to a particular subject? There's not uh, like a generic role. Um, mostly, first year study advisors are across um, targeted courses yeah. because of the student numbers in IKC foundation subjects. Um, there is a pilot, I guess, of um, a first year study advisor for our subjects too. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Um, while people are thinking of another question, Kim's just asked, can you please share the link to the CSU fake news resource in the chat? Um, we do love a bit of fake news. Um, a question for Marissa and Ruth, is there a particular source of um, information out there that's um, worse than others? Uh, is it the influences or is it just um, people trying to sell sell things? Yeah, I don't know um, if there, it's just yeah. so, I think that, um, that idea of the information overload and the critical ignoring really struck a chord with me because there is so much stuff out there and, I, I don't know if I can answer that question, um, you know, in terms of what's worse, mm. um, but I think what's really important is is recognising what is not good. Um, and, and yeah, I think that, you know, there's so many, and, and it's not just what's online either, it's also what's, um, you know, discussed within, over the, uh, literally at the kitchen table when people are eating their meal, um, you know, in that sort of broader context of eating, um, uh, yeah, that I think is, um, can be sort of perpetuated about nutrition. I don't know if Ruth wants to add. I agree that the complexity of the issue means it's not, there's not a, there's not sort of one answer and there's not, there's not one place that's worse than others. I'm just going to comment on pseudoscience. And I think some of the nutrition information that's out there can sound really good and people cherry pick information and put it together often to sell a product like a nutrition supplement or some sort of nutrition, um, you know, a special diet or something. Um, and they can make it sound so based in science. And sometimes I can read that and go, you know, that sounds, you follow what they say and you go, wow, they have done a really good job of making that sound so real. Um, so that whole, like that's another level of skill that people need to work through that. Um, but, yeah, it, it, so it's just I think we'll be in jobs forever in terms of helping people sort through this. Um, yeah, it's um, an ongoing challenge. Yeah, 
Thanks. That's um that's really interesting. And that's yes, sometimes you do read things um and it is amazing. You think, well, it must be true. Um, Jed, I'll hand over to you as the last question. And as I hand over to you, Jed, I'm just going to share the screen if people would like to start having logging into our conference feedback. Sure. Um, thank you for everyone who gave talks today. Some uh, really interesting stuff. Um, my question is for the Special K team. Um, just, I guess there's so many different um, generative AI platforms out there as, as you kind of um, addressed. And there's also like Google Bard and then there's um, ChatGPT 3.5 and ChatGPT 4 now. Um, and I guess, I guess this, I just would like to know your comments on this, this vast range. And I know you, complexity was um, one that you advocated for because it has that in-text citation. Um, but like Google Bard's doing that too and ChatGPT4 is doing that. So we, I guess, is can you comment on, is, is the end goal just to teach students how to use those platforms effectively? Um, yeah, a bit of a vague question, but uh, yeah, just kind of the different resources available and, and what's what's the end goal? I can answer that. Oh, well, I can try to answer that. Yeah, sorry. It's like, <laughs> that's all right. over the place. No, yeah, no, that's... that's right. I just also don't think there is an answer. Yeah, um, right. Okay. Uh, any comment? Is, um, yeah, would be I guess uh, our research and our focus was looking, we, we picked three at the time when we started because it was back in May that we started looking at these platforms and in in AI, things change so rapidly. Um, we chose three tools or platforms that were freely accessible to students as in they didn't have to pay for a subscription, um, acknowledging that they still need parental um, permission to access if they're under 18, which well, pretty much all school students are, uh, and they can't use them at all if they're under 13. Um, our idea was that um, to model or to suggest to teacher librarians how how they might use particular tools um, almost as a teaching tool in itself to demonstrate the skills and the strategies that the students can apply um, to. So it wasn't about specifically teaching a tool. It was about using the tool to demonstrate um, potential um, ad advantages, potential challenges, and also what skills you need to um, develop to be able to interact with information, whether or not that's created, you know, through chat or through perplexity or, and with leveraging the different, um, like, perplexity giving the reference, the links and things like that, leveraging that as a teaching strategy rather than, yeah, because, um, things change too quickly to be giving specific lessons on how to use a particular tool. And like I said, most students shouldn't be in schools, shouldn't be using those tools, you know, without permission from their parents and things like that anyway. We know they do, um, but, you know, as a teacher, yeah. Sure, yeah, no, that's that's um, super clear. Thank you for that. Cool. Hi. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for those wonderful questions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their active participation in the session today. Now, as I mentioned, I'd invite you to share your feedback on this session via the Charles Sturt edX feedback form, um, and the link is in the in the chat, and also, obviously, we've got the QR code. Um, the Charles Sturt edX conveners appreciate your feedback in planning this for future events. Um, so I'll now close the session and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.